Hello everyone, I have seen Dune Part 2 one time so far. I'm going to be seeing it again tonight and most likely over and over and over again. I saw it on Sunday night for a fan preview event with my parents and to one experience this film in the theater is an absolute must. IMAX if you can, Dolby or other premium screen. The crowd was electrified before the film even started. During the previews, you could feel the anticipation more and more. And then when Nicole Kidman came on, we're like, okay, Nicole, we know it. Heartbreak feels good in a place like this. That AMC ad that continues to play in front of films. We love it, don't get me wrong, but we need something new from Nicole. Okay, let's do it, AMC. We started to cheer when the final preview had ended. And we started to go into the uh, little final trailer of the theater of like, okay, boom, here we go. And we start. No spoilers here at this section, but captivated, riveted, and also in a very similar experience compared to The Lord of the Rings many years ago. Now it feels, oh my gosh, yet it feels like yesterday. But as a teenager, seeing The Two Towers for the first time, and that opening sequence of the two towers just blowing me away cinematically. And for this film to start in a way that is poetic compared to the first film. And continues with the same motif and such a beautifully visual experience of the planets. And seeing <laughs> Arrakis in a way that just reinforces why this is a huge moment. Because this is... Space, this is a combination of so many incredible professionals when it comes to filmmaking, both in front of them and behind the camera, and the continuation of something special of a film that I've seen 19 times, Dune Part 1, that really, really speaks to me, that resonates with me, that inspires me to want to create art such as this, or at least follow those that do create this type of art. So going into Dune Part 2 as well, it being based on a previous intellectual property, a book, a book that I read after seeing the first movie that I was familiar with and had read the the Wikipedia and the synopsis and the scenario and having it continue to unfold layer upon layer upon layer upon layer years into the book's existence from the 1960s. To have all that in mind and certain expectations of certain characters I would want to see because there's small but very memorable moments in the book. Um, yet as a filmmaker, listening to what Denis Villeneuve has been saying recently of it's a very painful process having to cut things that you absolutely love and the heartbreak that that would cause, especially someone who had gone to the lengths of casting people and shooting these scenes with these people to where the actors were very proud of the work that they had done, yet we will see those uh, performances, be they shorter or uh, less um, important to the main story because of time. And Denis Villeneuve talking about how you have to cater to what the film needs and the beauty of execution and um, expediency and doing it in a way where there's no fat, you know, and, and trimming the fat and having the film speak in such a way that it's almost like a dance. You feel that when do with Dune Part 1. Don't get to see a lot of the Mentats or find out more about the Mentats in, in Dune Part 1, along with, you know, don't you see members of the Spacing Guild and the Heraldry, but you don't see kind of the more evolved form of these humans that have been swimming in spice for so many years. But do, did it cater to the spirit of the book? Yes, absolutely. And did we get the majority of what any book fan would want in... Part one, absolutely. So going into part two with more characters, with more at stake, as a filmmaker, you have to think what were the things that needed to be cut and changed. And that was the first thing that I wrestled with, that I grappled with as soon as the film finished. And there's plenty of amazing things that happen in this film. There's incredible performances from Stilgar to Gurney to Paul to Chani to Je Lady Jessica to everyone. Everyone brought their A-game. The visual effects are outstanding. I noticed there were a couple shots that were used from Dune Part 1, yet the theme and what it was talking about still resonated. So it's almost like, was that actually part of the vision that Paul had seen and now he's seeing it in real time? 
the expansion of Chani as a character and more of the heart of the movie, the relationship between her and Paul and the bigger relationship that moves into the Fremen and the pushback of the Northern Fremen against the more fanatical Southern Fremen when it comes to this religion and the signs that Paul and Lady Jessica are are bringing to the table that are accomplishing what the prophecy said and the real power that gives them that Lady Jessica really recognizes that power and Paul actually sees the path ahead in ways that it frightens him and he knows if he goes down a certain path it's going to lead to uh, a lot of death and destruction so that is that is the core of Dune really the core of the book is a warning against charismatic leaders and religion and fanaticism and to see that play out in such a personal way with Chani and Stilgar and Paul and Lady Jessica and everyone else continues to wash over me continues to permeate my thoughts continues to provide such an illustration in my mind of their performance and what the filmmaker was able to accomplish with all these different pieces and then you add Austin Butler as Fade Rotha. Bro, they chant his name. And I started to get chills. I was scared. My parents were a little bit nervous. People in the audience were like, bro, this is one bad dude. Fade Rotha. It was, oh, that sequence is so great. And to see the power of black and white or infrared being used because they have a black sun. It's, I believe it's within lore. And the... Uh, remembrance of Oppenheimer using black and white in Strauss's viewpoint and to see filmmakers using color or the absence of color in a way that tells the story is so fascinating and such a beautiful tool to use. Hopefully it's not overused in the future. I wanted to see this movie again immediately because in ex the similar experience to The Two Towers, you're kind of ex expecting certain things, waiting for certain things to happen, wondering how the filmmaker is going to interpret certain things from the book. And at first, I thought, oh man, I really miss this part. I, I wish he really had this character in there. And then I was lying in bed afterwards, thinking about everything, and it started to continue to wash over me more and more and more. Why Chani was more expanded. Why these things cert happen in the, these certain ways, why this character didn't exist, why Paul did something compared to another character. And it really started to flow in a way cinematically that it made these connections and told the story with the same level of craftsmanship as Peter Jackson for The Lord of the Rings. And the more that it sticks with me, the more I want to experience it again to further feel the decisions that Denis Villeneuve had to make and to take the journey with him as a filmmaker and with everyone else and to appreciate the film for being the film and the book for being the book. Uh, that was just my first overall reaction of like, whoa, he ended it here? And you could feel it in the audience because on a fan preview, you know, this audience is all Dune fanatics for the most part, or they love the first movie at the very least. And there were definitely some claps at the end, but I, I was just in awe and reserved of thinking, oh, wow, he ended it here. Oh, wow, there's going to be a part three. <laughs> this is uh, quite the experience, folks. This is something very special. This is kind of the once in a generation type of cinematic experience. And uh, I am so looking forward to seeing it a second time. So I'll share more of my thoughts with you after seeing it a second time, which is going to be tonight. However, I'm going to put my hand up and talk about a, a couple specific spoilers. Now, I'm going to do this because this may change your expectations and your experience of the film in order to know these things ahead of time instead of all kind of waiting and, and wondering, am I going to see this person? Am I going to see this person at the end of the movie? I'm like, oh, I didn't see them. That being your first reaction, I'm going to tell you these things. Okay, here we go. No Count Fenring. There's no Count Fenring in the film, at least that I could tell. And the time span is, is pushed up a bit more. So Paul and Shani do not have a baby, um, but the impact of that attack that's from the books is definitely felt against the Fremen. And Aaliyah is not born, but she is a presence in the film. And to think about as a filmmaker, do I have a toddler talking like an adult? <laughs> or do I change some things that moves up the timeline, but still accomplishes the beats that are in the book and sets up the nature of who this person, Alia, will be? And to cast Alia with who they've cast, I think is of such a move 
in a way that maybe the genius is going to reveal itself more and more. Okay, spoilers done, hand down. I want to hear your thoughts down below. Uh, let's keep it, uh, we can keep it spoiler free. You can list spoilers because I'm going to make another video after seeing this film for a second time to talk about the spoilers. All right, you know what to do. It's YouTube, like and subscribe, and I'll see you online.